Welcome guys to this episode of It's a Matter of Facts, where we will be taking a look at some of the most dangerous and widely feared drug cartels in the world today, and a narcotics pandemic that is sweeping across the world. In particular, we'll be focusing on the infamous Colombian and Mexican drug cartels. In blockbuster Hollywood movies such as Scarface and Netflix um, docuseries Narcos, drug smugglers and cartel members have an allure about them. Dare I say it, they're romanticised by popular media. You know, luxury condos, private jets, designer clothes, women and billions in cash. There are a few people on earth that wouldn't see at least some appeal to this uh, lifestyle if given a chance to have it for themselves. But living that high life comes at a price, as in their wake lies a dark and twisted path of police and official corruption, betrayal, deceit, brutality, torture, and even murder. Now arguably the godfather of all known drug smugglers to this day, and dubbed the king of cocaine, is none other than Colombian Pablo Escobar. During his reign in the 1980s and 90s, Escobar was turning over in the region of $420 million each week as leader of a Medellin cartel, and at one point claimed that his cartel was even more powerful than his own government. Indeed it was, and many police officers and officials fell victim to both corruption and bribery, giving him safe passage to grow and build his drug empire. Such was this that Escobar adopted the name in his native Colombia, Plato o Plomo, which basically translates to accept a bribe or face bullets. Now, born in Rio Negro, Colombia on December 1st, 1949, Pablo grew up with very little money and started off with very humble beginnings as his mother was a school teacher and his father a local farmer. He got into small petty dealings very early on though, such as selling stolen cigarettes, cars, lottery tickets, and he even kidnapped the odd person here or there. The saying, start as you mean to go on, is very true here. In the height of his crimes, Escobar adopted a Robin Hood type persona within the poorer communities um, in Medellin, and would often give financial aid to those families most in need. And he was very much adored um, by some of the uh, local community whilst also being hated by others affected by his acts of widespread violence and, in some cases, pure terror. Now, Escobar was exceptionally good at using fear and intimidation to get what he wanted, resulting in the deaths of a presidential nominee, a justice minister, over 200 judges, and roughly um, a 1,000 police officers in total, all lost their lives. And these figures are on the conservative side, and are most probably uh, much higher than this. It is estimated that Escobar smuggled in a region of 15 tonnes worth of cocaine each day, which is crazy if you think about it. Now that's the equivalent of 15 baby humpback whales or great white sharks, all in all making him worth around 30 billion at the peak of his drug activity. Another interesting fact one evening, when holed up in one of his many getaway houses, his daughter Manuela became dangerously cold with hypothermia. Now, in order to warm her up, Pablo put $2 million in the fireplace, sparked it up and lit it just to keep her warm. When the American government had finally had enough of Escobar and his antics, they attempted to extradite him to the USA to face trial. But this seemed like a near impossible task. Pablo even offered the Colombian government a backhanded bribe payment of $10 billion to pay off the country's debt if it changes to uh, extradition laws could be met. Now, when arrested by the Colombian government, Escobar was housed in a luxury jail for him and his sicarios called La Catedral, or the Cathedral, except there was nothing holy about what went on inside. Drugs women, weapons and all sorts of other contraband were regularly smuggled in and the guards would just turn a blind eye to it, paid by Escobar to do so. What's clear is that Escobar was a very, very, very powerful figure, 
still revered by many Colombians even to this day, and his name is known throughout the world. Now it's definitely fair to say that Pablo Escobar both raised and set the bar for other drug smuggling operations to follow. Even after his death in December 1993, after being gunned down um, by police on a rooftop trying to escape. In 1986, years prior to his death, US President um, Ronald Reagan declared war on Escobar and other drug cartels, heightening security at all major and private airports and airstrips, causing the cartels to smuggle and find other ways um, into the country, mainly through uh, Mexico on land. Now, since the days of Pablo Emilio Escobar Guevara, Mexico has been gripped by the war on drugs too, and it feels very much like a repeat of what happened during the Colombian kingpin's heyday. Even very recently, Mexico's former defence minister, General Salvador Sinfuegos Zapeda, was indicted by the United States government on drug and money laundering charges after allegedly allowing one of Mexico's most feared cartels to act with impunity, thus turning a blind eye to their operation, as well as the brutal murder and torture of many individuals. Now, federal prosecutors claim that Cepeda allegedly assisted the infamous H2 cartel that operate primarily out of Nayarit and Sinaloa to smuggle thousands of kilograms of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine and marijuana into the United States between 2012 and 2018. In a letter supporting a motion for the permanent detention of Cepeda, it accuses him of abusing his position to ensure that military operations were not conducted against the H2 cartel and instead focus their attention onto rival cartels. It is also alleged that Cepeda informed H2 cartel bosses of ongoing investigations into their activities. He also provided sensitive information on informants. Now, since the death of Pablo Escobar, Mexican drug cartels have seized almost total power for themselves and now control over 90% of cocaine smuggled into the United States. And they are primarily responsible for the distribution of marijuana, heroin and methamphetamine to the rest of the world. Mexico drug trafficking is controlled by a total of seven powerful drug cartels. And these are La Familia Michoacan, the Gulf Cartel, Los Zetas, the Beltran Labor Organization, the Sinaloa Cartel, and the Tijuana Cartel, and lastly, the Juarez Cartel, worth an estimated $45 billion each year. Now, let's face it, it's a huge industry and a massive player in the Mexican economy, with the cartels generating around 80% profit from their activities. More than enough funds to eliminate anyone that stands in their way and terrorise the public, many of whom are too afraid to speak up for fear of further retribution. Despite the introduction of President Philippe Calderon in 2016, who has declared war on all cartel families, they continue to thrive and according to the DEA, with many forming um, inter-cartel alliances, partnering with transnational and US street gangs, prison gangs and Asian money laundering syndicates. The Sinaloa cartel, also known as the Pacific cartel, is one of the oldest and most dangerous of all cartels in the country and is considered to have the largest international infrastructure and now controls several major regions in Mexico. Also the cartel that has gained the most media notoriety over the past few years after the cat and mouse style games between Mexican and American police and their former owner and leader Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, who honestly has been banged up and broken out of prison more times than Michael Schofield in prison break. Back in 2019, a jury found that the former head of Mexico's Sinaloa cartel guilty of 10 counts of engaging and in a continuing criminal enterprise, drug trafficking, money laundering and conspiracy to commit murder and was sentenced to life in a maximum security prison for 30 plus years. In total, El Chapo, described as a bloodthirsty leader, has broken out of prison twice in his life so far. 
It does not seem as though this will be happening anytime soon though, after witnesses at his trial testified about him participating in the torture and murders of many cartel rivals. The Sinaloan cartel has hit headlines once again since the arrest of its leader after both his two sons waged war on his former business partner, Ismael El Mayo Zambeda, who has seen an opportunity to seize total control of the Sinaloan empire for himself. Guzman's oldest son Ivan, with the help of his brother Ovidio, have taken responsibility in taking back their father's business, but this will be by no means an easy feat, with DEA agent Jack Riley claiming that Mayo is now the most powerful drug trafficker in the world today, and his power and influence has been largely underestimated by the authorities. El Mayo began working his trade in a poppy field, and the now billionaire is a master at evading the authorities by claiming that he never sleeps in the same place more than once. Despite his riches, El Mayo prefers to stay under the radar in all of his business dealings, and his lifestyle is far from lavish. The same can't be said for El Chapo though, who with shades of Pablo Escobar flaunted his vast wealth with fancy exotic getaways, expensive condos, and even building his own zoo. Regardless of this, who knows how the tale of the world's most powerful drug cartel will end. El Chapo faces life behind bars and El Mayo is getting on a bit at 72 years of age and he also suffers from diabetes, leaving Guzman's sons as the only likely successors to the throne in years to come. Now, this is some pretty heavy stuff there, if you ask me, and I hope you could keep up with everything. One thing for certain is that the activity of these drug cartels very much influences what happens in our streets. We are not talking small time petty dealings here. These guys literally control and dominate the entire drugs market. You could say these are the heads of a snake. That's the only way that I can put it. What's clear is that this is not something that will be going away anytime soon. And there will always be someone to step in and take over at any point. It's really just a waiting game for that to happen. I hope that you enjoyed this video um, and this episode of this matter of facts. Please give this video a like and let me know what you think down in the comments section. Also, please make sure that you hit that big red subscribe button if you haven't done so already to never miss a future video of ours. Please also check out some of our other fantastic videos in the It's a Matter of Facts playlist. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again very soon.